What's up, Active Lifers? Welcome back to the Active Life Podcast. I'm Dr. Sean Pastuch. I'm your host. And today's guests, multiple, are Alicia and George McKenzie. Alicia owns Lift Like a Mother, which is a coaching program for moms to get their life in order from fitness to nutrition to habits to thought. She helps moms put themselves first and take care of themselves in a way that allows them to take care of all of the things that mothers need to take care of around the house, the kids, the relationship. It is a full-time job to be a mom. And she helps those moms actually, in another company, put that job description on their resume. So we talked to Alicia and George about how moms can actually bring a ton of value to the workplace, how their relationship changed and how they manage their relationship to support their businesses and their family as they started and grew and sold a very successful cybersecurity company, a CrossFit gym, and now are launching a new cybersecurity company. It's a really interesting podcast on the relationship dynamics between husband and wife, father and mother and the kids. And I think that you're really going to enjoy this if you have any interest in learning how to be successful as both a parent and a spouse, and an employee or an employer. Let's get you to it. We're going to get to the show in a minute. What I want to talk about first is the new Active Life Enhanced Assessment. We've been getting a lot of questions from you about what do I do when it bothers my knee when I squat, but not when I do anything else. And you're not necessarily ready to work with us as a one-on-one client, and we totally understand that. We've gotten hundreds of questions just like the one I just said. My knee hurts when I do this. What should I do about it? And the honest answer is always it depends. And we need to ask many more questions to give you the best answer. We decided that the best way for us to help you with the thorough answer to those questions is to develop a product, a service that can help you. So we came up with the Active Life Enhanced Assessment. This is a four-day process in which you go through the similar assessment to what our one-on-one clients go through. You get to talk to one of our staff members about what it is that they found on your assessment, and they will give you instruction on how to overcome the aches and pains that have been plaguing you for a long time without going to the doctor or missing the gym, if it's appropriate for you to do that. So if you're interested in jumping into our Active Life Enhanced Assessment, go ahead, check out the link in the story notes, the show notes, excuse me, and we'll see you there. Alicia and George McKenzie, welcome to the Active Life Podcast. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. It's my pleasure. I think I'd have to go back in time, and I'm I'm probably wrong about this, and someone's going to yell at me, but I think you're the first married couple I've had on the podcast together. I've had husband and wife on separately, but I don't know that I've ever had husband and wife on together. So, hey, awesome. Breaking barriers all over the place. That's it. Just knocking down walls. That's it. So... I talked about it a little bit in the intro, but I would really like to start by asking you to is just kind of dive straight into it. You've been successful by any measure in your relationship, in your businesses, and you've done a lot of that work together. Selfishly, I want to know because my wife just worked her last day and we're trying to figure out what she wants to do when she grows up now. <laughs> What is the most difficult thing about being successful in a relationship and a business at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I I think for me, it's one, it's, you know, probably the only relationship in which you get to choose your partner, you know, 24 hours a day. So, you know, on the business side of the house, I think the most difficult side is, is when you draw that cutoff, right? And how do you have those business conversations and taskings and making sure that you're both doing what's right for the company and all your employees and, and for your clients. And then also be able to balance the personal interpersonal relationship between husband and wife, you know, mom and dad, and and keep those things, you know, I guess on even playing fields, obviously it's not exactly even because the marriage always takes precedence, right? You don't want to have a business relationship that becomes toxic for your, your personal relationship and making sure that as you go through the day to day challenges and taskings and, Hey, did you not do that? Why didn't you do that? And Hey, we have to do this. Do you understand the bill has to be paid and stuff like that? that how do you make those, you know, 
conversations, but not make them personal that way, you know, that you can have that conversation and you can, you know, maybe argue about what the best path forward is for the business, but not be in argument with your spouse. And that's, that's extremely difficult because I'm sure so <laughs> difficult because I, I like, I will just say like, you're not my boss right now and I will get up and walk away. <laughs> it's difficult to just kind of switch between those roles. But um, I think I think we do a good job. I mean, like we're showering and we're having like deep business conversations in the shower, but then we're also showering and not having those deep conversations in the shower. So I think it's just figuring out the right time and place when you need to talk about different things and, and just, I don't know, flowing with those roles. That's a lot of ebb and flow. Do you have a clear way to describe that this is a boundary and I need you to stop right now? And I'll give you some clarity on that. So let's let's say you're in the shower. I'm assuming at least two shower heads. I mean, my wife and I shared one shower head. We're redoing our house right now. And the biggest reason was I'm like, I like taking a shower with you, but not with one shower head because I'm cold right now. It's not comfortable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But so if, if in the shower, like if we're in a relaxing conversation, then all of a sudden a business conversation comes up or a I'd like us to go and do this conversation comes up. Right now, we don't work together. So it's easy. It's, oh, yeah, well, okay, you want to go to that place? Well, let's talk about going to that place. If it came up where I had a stressful day at the office for whatever reason, and I didn't want to vocalize it when I was home and she starts talking about it, I don't know what I would say to be like, you know what? I don't really want to have this conversation right now. I think we're really good at reading each other. Like I can tell when he's stressed, I can just see it all over his face and he doesn't think so, (laughs) but like, I know what to avoid. And I think it's the same thing. Like for me, he can definitely tell when I've had a good day and I'm just like chattering it off, like just nonstop. And like, he'll, he'll ask me about it. He'll do whatever, but he can tell when I've had a bad day too. And we just kind of avoid the subject. So I think it's just that we've been together for so long that we, we can just read each other's emotions, body language. Like I can tell when his jaws clenched and all that stuff. So I, I think it's, yeah. that just comes with time. How long yeah. have you been together? Um, 13. Yeah. Almost 13. 13. Oh, we've 14. been married for almost 10, 14 okay. years or so. Yeah. So, I think it's, it's a game of ping pong. And then sometimes, you know, you gotta, you gotta see how the, how the life is, how the ball is coming back at you. Like, for me, it's, I'm sure, I don't know how to read myself externally, so I, I can't comment on that. But with her, it's more of like, sometimes it's a great day and sometimes it's, you know, that ping pong, it's like watching, you know, Olympic level Chinese people playing, right? And it's just conversation back and forth and where everybody's happy and we're brainstorming and things are things are morphing and then you're just, you know, constantly spinning the ball. And then sometimes it's, you know, it's a bunch of lob shots and you feel like you're just running corner to corner to try to get them and you're like, all right, maybe... Maybe we need to slow this down and, you know, turn the conversation to something else. Mm-hmm. You just get the, you know, you get that routine. I think it's that way with anything. Like even in, you know, my other company outside of the, you, you just develop those relationships with people and you understand that, Hey, you know, this is where you have to steer the conversation and you can only, you know, beat a dead horse so long, right? You get to a point where, Hey, we, we had this conversation all day and about on this work related topic and we, we can't seem to get to, you know, ground on it. And then eventually, you know, you got to start talking about something else or you let that conversation die and you say, Hey, let's, let's go do something together. And then sometimes that's when you get probably the most meaningful conversations, even work related. When you're not doing something work related, you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Like some, we'll, we'll play golf together or we'll just go for a walk in the afternoons. And sometimes you find yourself, you know, talking about trees or birds. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you get back into the work thing, but it's in a, you know, less stressful environment and you just talk it out. I played golf yesterday or on Sunday this week for the first time in 12 years. Oh, nice. Oh yeah. Hey. I mean, I, I, one ball, I only use one ball, which that was a, a win. That is a win. I bought, I bought 12 balls and I considered buying 24 cause I thought it was gonna be that kind of a day. I was borrowing someone else's clubs. You know, I was, I was playing in sneakers. I had nothing. I was just like, yeah, I'll go. My brother-in-law invited me to play. And I ended up not like there was one ball in the bag I never even opened the ball, the bat, the balls that I bought. That's awesome. That's a win. I'm telling it's you, it's a this. win. I shot a 108, so it wasn't like it wasn't like I was scratch golfing. Shot a 108, but we didn't lose the ball. Yeah, hey, it, it's fun, and I think uh, it's 
three and a half to four hours of, you know, opportunities for conversations. Yeah. So something that I, I, I am always interested in is neither one of you come across to me and I, and forgive me. I know more about Alicia than I know about you, George. Neither one of you come across to me as a passive, submissive, just, okay, I'll, I'm just along for the ride kind of person. You, you both strike me as I'm going to do my thing, entrepreneurial, enterprising, whether you're looking to build a huge business or just get after your golf game. Where is the balancing act there? Do you guys find that there's like a, I have to let this person win this one or uh, do you follow what I'm getting at there? Yeah, no, I, I think we're ultra competitive. I mean, to a fault, I think you know, to that degree, we, we think about it, at least we're cognizant of it and we understand the competitiveness where we're like, Hey, you know, do we want our kids to be as competitive as we are? Are we worried about, you know, in life, is that going to be a downside, even though it's been beneficial to us? But yeah, I mean, even though, you know, at this point in my life, she is the better athlete and she probably has been for a decade or so. I was going to say, she probably was when you met too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I am better at golf though. So there's a couple things Seriously. for now, for now. I can and still out drive him. Sometimes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, from the ladies. Hey, hey, hey. Ah, uh, I see. I see. So as long, yeah. I got you. So she ends yeah. up further forward. Right. So, I mean, you know, it, it's give and take competitiveness. I don't know if we compete in life. I think we're on the same team. So it's, you yeah. know, and well, yeah, we, you, you can't you can't have a, a bunch of uh, you know the, the baseball team can't have three pitchers, right? So it's, you know we have to know which position we're playing for the team, mm -hmm. but we can all throw the ball, right? So and then I think when we work out in the gym, still sometimes we'll go out in the garage and it's you know you start doing wall balls and it's you know you're doing a set of thirty and then I, you you plan to take a break, but you, she doesn't put it down. I'm not putting it down. Right. And then it's, yeah, right. <laughs> And then, and then neither one of us can walk. Yeah, the next exactly. Day. <laughs> and then now you're doing, you know, three or four sets of 30 unbroken and you're just like, I'm not dropping it. She's not dropping it. So we're just going to go. Well, <laughs> how, how does that work with the kids? Cause I mean, what do you have four kids? Is it three oh, yeah. or four? four? Yeah. They're I, God, they're, they're little clones <laughs> of, of you two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what I more mean there is uh, in, in my relationship at home, my wife is very mothering. I'm like, I love my kids to death for an hour and a half a day. <laughs> I, I really, I really do. Like I love them and I would do anything for them. I, I want to be really present when I'm with them. And I find that like after 80, 90, a hundred minutes, I'm just like, all right, like I, I got nothing for you, kid. I love you. I got to go for a walk or something. I don't know if, if you two feel similarly. And I don't know if I'm conflating my personality with entrepreneurship and my wife's with, mothering because she's not entrepreneurial and, and then assuming that you guys are both feeling the way that I do all the time. I'm just curious how that works in your house. It's so strange. It's like he has multiple personalities. Um, like I'll just use this morning as an example. The kids woke up super early. It was before 6am. They were both up and they went downstairs. They turned on the TV and I was going to change and go downstairs. I laid back down and I fell asleep. Like that never happens. I slept until it was after eight when I finally woke up. He was already out of bed downstairs. He had made them breakfast. He had gotten them all set up. And when I came downstairs, like they were doing marble races and like they were just, he'd like taken full charge and let me sleep. So like he's, probably one of the best dads and like the most hands on dad that like I've just ever encountered. And like, I don't know what I did or what changed. Like I, I really never expected it. Like we, we always knew we wanted to have kids and he's always worn like this hardcore CEO hat and everybody sees him and he's just, he's this persona and he's intimidating and he doesn't think so, but people are intimidated by him. And, um, he's nothing like that at home. It's so interesting to see the dichotomy of his personalities. So I don't know, like we're, we're really hands-on. We're really, um, we're very involved in everything. Like he coaches T-ball. Um, I don't know. It's, it's completely different. And the same thing for me, like I love being a mom. I will read 50 stories to them at night and lay in bed with them and rub their backs and scratch their heads. Like it's, it's interesting, like how you can be one way in your business and then completely different at home. 
And how old, I mean, how old are your kids? I'm sorry to interrupt you. How, yeah. how old are they? Uh, almost 15, nine, almost six, and almost four. So when the 15 and nine-year-old were younger, you were in the thick of the cybersecurity company, yes? yes. Uh, in my first one, yeah. And then we were, we were also running a CrossFit gym, and she was competing. Right. So, yeah, I mean, Elisa was snatching 200 pounds before it was a thing. Yes. Yeah. So – was it as easy for you to, to provide that space and the energy for the kids when you were, when they were younger, when you were in the thick of your businesses? Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. It was, it's just making that time and, you know, understanding that, you know, when we were working out in the gym, right. The kids, you know, would run around and, and be engaged with us, but it wasn't, you know, you didn't get full time and attention, right. There was, a, I mean, it takes a village. So, her mom was always in the gym and is with us. And then we had you know, all the other people in the gym that would help out. But I think making it a priority for me, it's, it's pretty easy. And then when it's work time, they, they understand that I have to work and that we're on family vacations or we're outside at the pool or we're doing whatever. A phone call comes in, daddy has to take a call and you know, I have to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I and think so- that's kind of always been the case and they kind of understand that. Right. And Alicia, earlier you mentioned that, you find that other people find George to be intimidating and he doesn't see the same thing. Yeah. Is it, is, I mean, I can, I can tell just looking at you right now, there's some muscles underneath that white shirt you got on. Is it, (laughs) is it the physical presence that George carries or is it more of the, the energy that he brings with him? I think it's, it's all of the above. Like you, you kind of, you see him and he, he doesn't smile. (laughs) <laughs> I don't think that's the case. I think I'm very approachable. He's, I don't understand. He's, he's not. It's, it's so funny. Like, I, I don't know. I just, I love watching him interact, like, in his environment. Like, I'll play the wife role and I'll just kind of sit to the side and, like, let him do his thing. And it's like, damn. Like, just watching him from afar, I'm like, okay, I'd hit that. <laughs> <laughs> Four times. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> no. But yeah, it's, he's a completely different person outside of this house. And yeah, it's yeah, worked, I think, in, worked in his favor. Yeah, I think kids, yeah, for me, they, they just, yeah, somehow they have that innate ability to, yeah, make you melt yes. in, in an infant, right? And then it's it's hard to, you know, hey, I'm in this, you know, I, you know keep this CEO persona or keep this, you know husband persona or, or disciplinarian or whatever you try to do when, when they come in. But yeah, you know, I, I enjoy it. But I think to your point, like there are time limits, like she's way better at the whole, Hey, let's read 50 stories. Like mm-hmm. I get one story and yes, I'm ready to move on. Yes. Right. And when, when they've had a long day, especially my sons, they have a long day and then they give, you know, like she says, they have big emotions at night. Yeah. You know? And that's where I think, me, I, I have a problem. I don't know if it's a male thing or what, but you're like, you know, I, I can't just keep asking you six times to do something. And then, you know, mm-hmm. then the tears start or the I'm not doing it start. And then it's kind of that yin and yang. It's she, that tag off. Yeah, right. she'll take over and she can get them bathed. Like we, we bathe them together every night and we brush our teeth. And, you know, most nights it's easy and, you know, routine, everything just works. And then when it's, you know, past their expiration, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> the expiration date goes off and then they're like, oh, nope. I'm not getting undressed. I'm not showering. I'm not bathing. And it's like the 15 minutes to get them to brush their teeth. And then I'm like, I'm out. Right. Yeah. You're like, I can get you to brush your teeth. You're just not going to, it's not going to be comfortable for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and that's kind of where I, I mean, that's, I don't know. I feel, I'm very uh, good at getting down on their level and they listen to mommy. Like, mm-hmm. Just they'll, they'll just do it. They'll well, do whatever I ask. And they're so sweet. I find that really interesting because one of the things that I've described to my wife is I'm more than happy to put the kids down to bed. They just don't want me to. They prefer you to. So when you do it, I understand that it takes longer for you. When I do it, it doesn't take less time. It's just them yelling at me while I'm trying to do it. And I'm like, why don't you just put them to bed? I'll continue to cook. I'll continue to do the other things. And you just, you know, you just do the bed thing. So, our middle child is starting to come around. She actually is asking for me. I'm like, this is great. I really enjoy putting you to bed. It's not a fist fight. Uh, but so I, I follow you there, George. It's like, look, this is the end of it's enjoyable. So now yeah. mom's going to come and do it. Cause she's more patient than I am. At least that's how it goes in our house. Yeah. I, I, and then they're good. So most of the time it's, it's not an issue. It's just, 
whenever they're overly tired. But my daughter, she's nine, the middle, the second daughter. And yeah, mm-hmm. we yeah, had a routine since she was like three. I, I carry her to bed every night. So, it's so, so gross. Like she comes down and just time to go to bed. <laughs> it'll, it'll make you vomit. She'll come over and she'll just stand in front of him, put her arms out and she'll be like, I'm ready for bed. And he'll swoop her up and carry her up the stairs and put her to bed. Like it's like, yeah, it's so sweet. Like it makes your teeth hurt. Yeah. Just got it. I know it's coming to an end one day. Right. So you just like, you Maybe. save her these last few, she's nine. I can't imagine it lasting much longer. You don't know. She, she might like go out for her 17th birthday, come home and you're, you're sleeping and she's just tapping <laughs> you on the right, shoulder. Right. Yeah. And she just puts her arms up and you're like, all right, it's 3am, but I guess I'll get up and carry you to bed. <laughs> so, one of the the way that we really got connected is Alicia made a post that, that I don't remember verbatim what it said. I probably should have looked it up before I started this interview today. It was the idea of remember she's a mom before she's your employee. And Sheila who manages, she, I call Sheila my work mom because she manages my entire schedule, my life. Like I have, she, she puts the coffee breaks on the schedule. She reminds me to eat lunch. Like that's, that's what she does she reposted it and she was talking about how grateful she was that she works at a company where her leadership sees her as a mom first and as an employee second. And I really want to dig into how you two do that in your businesses with your staff. And I'm frankly less interested in how you did it towards the end of your last business, George, when you guys were getting ready for a purchase and an exit. I'm more interested in how you did it when you were in a similar phase to us, which was the fairly early startup of the business. And you need all of the energy from all of the people to help get this thing moving. And at the same time, you want to respect the family values. How did you do that early on? Yeah, I mean, I can talk about, so at my previous company, so I have a startup now, a cybersecurity company that we're kind of doing the same thing. But yeah, I agree. I think, you know, one, it's the, diversity aspect right of of having mothers and having people that have had different you know views of life and then they're probably even have a different view of life than you do today like you were saying that you know mothers have priorities right they're normally the ones that have to go to the doctors and they have to take care of the the screaming children in the background when they're working from home and, mm-hmm. and those type of things but it's it's really creating a culture where you value outcomes right and and not ours so I think that's that's kind of what we're doing in the new company that I have and even in the old company where, you know, we've moved to unlimited PTO and, and making it more of, hey, we're worried about you producing outcomes for the clients that we're, we're working with and then for the company that, hey, we're all in this boat together, right? And we need every oar in the water and we got to be rowing this direction. And, you know, whether you're rowing at a 10 or a 7 or you pull your, row, your oar out of the water for a little bit and the rest of us continue to row, that's fine. As long as we're always going that way, what we don't want is people with their oar in the water not rowing or rowing the wrong way, right? So, and yeah, you know, I think it's if you create that culture where people feel valued for you know their skill set and the outcomes that they're delivering, and it, for me personally, like some of the best project managers and coordinators and people that helped create the flow of the business and make sure that you know we're doing things. Yeah, in a sequential way and multitasking have, have been mothers. I mm-hmm. think that that skill set transfers a lot, especially in IT where a lot of us and, you know, a lot of the employees are, are single guys that, you know, mm-hmm. do a, do a thousand things and chase a, a thousand squirrels, but never actually catch or finish anything. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of getting that more of that motherly experience of, you know, settling down, focusing, doing something. But it's, it's definitely a culture that you have to build it from the top down that, you know, everybody takes time off and everybody has the ability to do things that are required in life first and then work second. And Alicia, I imagine that you're talking to a lot of the moms. <laughs> I think um, their mothers multitask and plan and schedule and coordinate like none other. Because we have to, like, there's some of the most organized people that I have ever worked with. And I'm, I'm heavily involved in a company called Hey Mama, and it's a networking organization for mothers 
full of entrepreneurs, doctors, and they, they kind of, they, they started the motherhood on the resume kind of project, which is, I think the post you're talking about. And it's basically teaching moms who are trying to re-enter the workforce, how to translate their motherly skills into a resume line item. Right. So let's let's take potty training, for example. It's research. It's setting a timeline. It's reevaluating something if it doesn't work. It's not just potty training. Mm -hmm. So I think um, just trying to put that out there and say, like, moms, you're not useless. You're not just a mother. You are so much more and you belong in the workforce if that's where you want to be. And I'm finding that analogy you just made so interesting the potty training one because it's also patience you know it's it's personal responsibility because it doesn't always go right and there's some cleanup to be done there yeah. and i mean i remember the one time our uh our four-year-old who's now four years old was an infant and our six-year-old was a two-year-old and she was the infant was laying on the ground she couldn't move she was an infant and the two-year-old was squatting down in potty training and just like you know playing with her and all this and she got up and walked away and there was a big dump on the floor right next to our infant we're like oh we didn't see that happening yeah but so you know the interesting thing about what you're describing there is i never thought of it as a job skill and you're right it is one it's just explaining it in a way where somebody will understand that it is exactly when sorry go on Another another big one that really like just drives it home for me is coordinating the holidays. If you have multiple children and you're trying to go somewhere, coordinating all of that and making sure people get where they need to be on time, making sure they're fed, making sure they're everything. It's it's logistics, it's planning, it's budgeting, it's all of that wrapped into motherhood. And so when, I, when you say motherhood on the resume, do you mean that in a literal way? Where, oh yeah. So George, have you ever gotten a resume from a mom who put motherhood on the resume? I have not. I wish I wish they would. I think that's something extremely valuable and and things that like you're talking about that the, the transferability of those skills when written out and also from a, a mother's perspective of having that confidence and that, you know, brag, you know, being able to brag about yourself that what you did as a mother and the skills that you learned and the ability to adapt and overcome and plan and then replan and rebaseline expectations and all of those things that have to happen, being able to put that on your resume and articulate that to a hiring manager, I think would speak volumes. And if the hiring manager doesn't see that translation, then you probably shouldn't be working there anyway. Are there, are there barrier? I, I agree with you, but are there barriers that an employer or a hiring manager has to be careful of? to avoid asking a mom questions that, that almost seem discriminatory, even though the intent is, no, no, I want to understand how you plan motherhood. I want to understand how motherhood is a part of your being. I'm picturing myself right now, the reason I'm asking this is selfish. I'm picturing myself interviewing somebody who's a mom and who doesn't have a ton of job experience in our specific space. And me just prying about the way that she mothers and having her be like, why is this guy asking all these questions about me as a mom and thinking that like, oh, I'm not going to get hired because I'm a mom. How that, that seems like a line. Yeah. I mean, I think the, you'd have to be careful as the employer, but if the, the way I would view it is if the applicant or the mother had it on their resume, just like any other job and put in, you know, line items and bulleted of what they accomplished and how, and you're asking questions about it. You're like, Oh, you have logistics on your resume. Can you explain, you know, a situation in which you had to use that skill set to accomplish a task or, you know, and then I think the bigger problem and from an interviewer having done this several times is when there's a big gap on the resume, right. And you're like, Hey, you had a job in, 2008 and then you had another job in 2016 what was that eight-year gap which is a more uncomfortable conversation because you kind of know what you think you know what it is but you can't Mm -hmm. ask and then they feel defensive because they're like oh well i was a stay-at-home mom for eight years and then you can see sometimes i've seen like that they feel now defensive and then they're on the 
the retreat about, I have to explain that I didn't work for eight years and that I am still valuable in the workplace and my skills haven't diminished over those eight years. And is the way that you, I'm sorry, go ahead, Alicia. Yeah. Which is, which is why I think what Hey Mama is trying to do, they're trying to get these mothers to actually put motherhood on their resume. Mm -hmm. So if you have that eight year gap and you can articulate what you were doing in those eight years, Hey, I potty trained. Hey, I planned all of this. Hey, I did the budget for our entire household. Hey, I did this. And if you can put that on paper and actually speak to it to a hiring manager, that's, there's value there. There's a ton of value there. I think that it also, one of the things that I find uniquely interesting is, is when people need to be let go from a company. I, I don't see it as a, you're a bad person who did a bad thing, so you need to go. I see it as a, our values and your values don't align for whatever reason. And so asking you to stay here would be inconsiderate of us as a company to ask of you. I can see a potential problem for moms who put motherhood on the resume in that not every company is going to have the open-mindedness to value that in the way that perhaps they could or should. And I can see a mom being angry that she didn't get hired for a job that she may have been great for because the company didn't value the motherhood. But I think that'd be the wrong company for the mom. And she just got to find out earlier. What are, what are your thoughts on that? No, I think that's a hundred percent. Yeah. That, you know, either way, if you have it on the resume, you at least can talk to it and explain your skill set. If you don't have it on the resume, it's a hole that you're going to have to address more defensively. Mm -hmm. But at the end, if they don't value that experience that you're bringing and it's a say, I think you hit the nail on the head when you, letting someone go is terrible. It's always a bad, I mean, mm -hmm. I I've had to do it. We, you know, at running companies and, you know, we grew to, you know, 400 and some employees at the first company. And you know, to get that big, you, you let some people go at some point. And most of the time that when you let someone go, you find what you said is true is that it's just a mismatch, right? That either we weren't set up correctly for you to be successful and the things that you needed to be successful, we weren't able to give you or vice versa. The things that we needed from you to be successful, you, you may not have been bringing to the table. And, you know, it, it's never, um, you know, you're at fault. He, you know, we're at fault. It's always, you know, we came to this together that, you know, either so, somewhere we let each other down. Mm -hmm. And I think that from an employer employee perspective, that the mother is interviewing, they got to realize that too, that the company you're going to work for, yeah, you want the job and you probably are perfect for the job and you bring a set of skills and experiences and unique, you know, view of how you would do this job. And they probably have, the flip side of that of how they want the job done and what they want on that end. And sometimes it's a mismatch and you wouldn't want that job if, you know, they were looking for uh, you know, a square peg and you're a round peg, right. That you could try to jam it in there and see, see what happens. But you know, the outcome is probably not going to be good. Yeah. It's more, you think you want that job. If, if, if they said, this is the job. And by the way, this is how we think you might be like, I'm not even going to apply for that job. That's not where I want to be. So, Alicia, what I want to ask you about, and then I want to get into lift like a mother in a second, because you don't just help women get their name on the, you know, their motherhood on the resume. You also help them get their life in order. What I want to ask you before I get to the getting their life in order part is there, how do we help or how do you help the moms keep boundaries for, look, yeah, we want you to be a mom first you got to be a well-organized mom. You don't get to just call up and say, I can't come in today because my kid um, has a thing and I forgot about it. You don't get to come in late because, oh, I, I, you know, I got stuck in traffic taking my kid to school. It's like you, you do need to still be a high-level quality employee. Where does the line of personal responsibility come in and how do you express it to women? Honestly, it's been trial and error for me. I've definitely worked with a couple of people that have not worked out because they just weren't planners, but I don't think that's them as a mother. I think that's just them as a person. Mm -hmm. So I think when you're, when you're talking to people, when you're interviewing, whether or not you want to work with them, it's, it's going to be like, how do you, how do you coordinate your days? How do you schedule? Are you, are you organized? Are you detail oriented? Which I hate using all those buzz, buzz words, but it's true. I think as a mother or even as an employee and employer, you have to 
figure out how to organize and prioritize your time. So if that means that let's just take my daily, my daily schedule, I'm incredibly time blocked. Like I time block everything unless I oversleep, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) which doesn't happen often, but, uh, it's just looking at your schedule for the week, figuring out what you need to do, placing it on that weekly calendar, and then knowing when to shut it off. Like there will be some nights where I'm working on my computer until 10 o'clock at night, but I'm not answering email. I'm doing stuff to catch up or get ahead. Mm-hmm. All right. So I think it's as an employer, you have to be respectful of your employees' boundaries. And that means not sending emails at 10 o'clock at night and not expecting them to work on the weekends and just, yeah, you set your boundaries and you stick within them. Is it not sending those emails or is it creating the precedent with your, with your employees that they don't have to respond to those emails? Not sending them. Oh man. I sent an email at midnight last night. And yeah, I mean, I think for, for, <laughs> For me personally, and it's, I actually just did a post about this. It's nobody's going to ignore their boss over the weekend. Right. And I get that that is the idea that you have in your mind. Oh, I don't, I don't expect a response. That's okay. You got kids. It's okay to turn the background. Hey, excuse me. Good, sir. What's the, what's the problem? (laughs) Let's, can we share that until we get done and we'll go find yours, Maddox. Okay. I need you to go that way. Thank you. There you go. Crisis management. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I told you if we had a boy, it was going to be Maddox. Oh, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, we we've got Maddox and Maverick. Nice. We didn't have a boy. We had three girls. Oh, okay. That's stormtrooper. Right. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. Um, nobody is going to ignore their boss whether or not you expect them to. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, don't send the email utilize, um, sending. So if you, if you need to type it up, set it to send at 8am Monday morning. That's a good idea. Yeah. The email scheduling is a good one. She does it. I'm not, not so great at that either. And I I think back to your, the question, just if I could chime in, even though it wasn't directed to me, I think it's the, uh, it's telling mothers and even guys, it's, it's not any different, right? That guys have the same excuses or same, have the same challenges when it comes to time management. Oh, you know, I'm late because there was traffic this morning or, you know, and I think that you you have to understand at some point the personal responsibility one, but the other is, is time is extremely valuable and it's the only thing outside of family love and, you know, you know, community that is valuable. And if you, you have to value your time, just like someone else's time. So if you're running late constantly, you got to reevaluate how you're spending your time. Like I'm, how am I spending my time in my mornings? Am I, you know, doing something that's causing me not to leave the house on time? Or am I not putting things on the calendar, which calls me to lose control of my time during the day? And then, you know, like to your point, I'm calling up the employer and saying, hey, I'm coming in late today because I forgot about so-and-so's dentist appointment, right? Mm-hmm. And then now, did you waste four hours of that person's time, which is extremely valuable. It's, it's like, you know, would you, you know, waste someone's, you know, a couple hundred dollars of someone's money just because you forgot? You know, if you start to, I think, looking at time as a valuable resource and not an unlimited resource, I think will help frame out people. And I think it's even the health and wellness, the whole the adage, right? If you don't make time for your health, you, you know, you're going to be forced to make time for make your time sickness, for your sickness yeah. right? It's the same. It's time is incredibly valuable. And if you're not using it correctly, it's just like money. If you're not applying that in the right place, then well, you're going to pay for it. So let, let, let's make this shift to health and wellness because lift like a mother is your company, Alicia. And, yeah. and, in that company, you're, you're effectively helping mothers, right, to get all of the things that they need to do to live healthy lives in order. And I would love for you to ex- explain to me what makes that different for a mom than it would for a non-mom. I think it's the guilt factor. Women seem to feel guilty for taking time for themselves away from their children, But I think we really need to normalize that in order for you to be 
a really, really good mom, you have to take care of yourself first. If you are tired, if you're run down, if you're hungry, if you're sick, you are not going to be the best mother that you could possibly be. But if you are taking 30 minutes, three times a day and throwing in some walks, then you're, you're naturally going to be a better mom. You're going to be a better wife. You're going to feel better about yourself, which is going to make you a better you. So, so I think you- it's, it's really, it's really important to just normalize that it's okay to not be around your kids 24 seven. Do you provide strategies for the moms to like, what do you do with your kids when you're not with them? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, I'll take one of my clients, for example, she came to me never working out, um, despised working out. And we started with five minutes a day every morning, as soon as she got up Mm -hmm. and we scheduled two dedicated walks a week. And that was how she got, that's, that was how she did her fitness for the first week. The second week we made it three walks and five minutes a day in the morning. And she worked out with her spouse that, okay, this is when I'm going to do my walks. You stay with the kids and I'll be back. And then that slowly graduated to, she got a set of dumbbells and now she does three 30 minute work, uh, workouts while the kids are eating lunch. She's in plain sight of them. And then she does two walks a week and She's gradually lost weight, even though that wasn't our focus. She feels better about herself. She feels stronger. Don't worry about the kids. It's <laughs> your company's called Lift Like a Mother. If I'm going to be strict about like, hey, I need those kids quiet in the background. We got a problem. It's making sure nobody's screaming mm-hmm. <laughs> or like bloody murder or something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I think it's just teaching them how it doesn't have to be three hours a day, five days a week, like. More is not always more. Mm-hmm. And I think that's interesting, the guilt factor, because I, I don't know that I'd considered the guilt factor. You know, oh, what, yeah. when, when a, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go you ahead. go, you go, you go, you, you. Yeah, you. no, that's, that's like a common thing. Like with every mom, it's like, oh, I feel guilty for leaving my children. Like, good God, why? <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's stop that. Like the guilt does nobody any good. And I think, but it's any mom. I don't. I don't know where it comes from, but even myself, like I find myself, like if George and I will go on a trip together, I feel guilty because I miss my kids. So it's, I think it's just innately built into us. Maybe. I don't know that I'd feel guilty on that trip. (laughs) My wife might, I don't know that I would. So when we were talking before the show started, you described to me that it's more than nutrition. It's more than exercise. There's, there's lifestyle built into it. And what what you're talking about right now kind of sounds like that. It's the idea of, I don't care if you work out every day. I want you to become the kind of person who just would move. Like start to associate yourself as the kind of person who does this. And the the way I've talked to um, our clients in the past about this is kosher Jews don't try to avoid shellfish. You know, Muslims don't try to avoid liquor. It's, it's just things that they're in their life. And they, they associate as somebody who wouldn't do those things. So if you just associate as somebody who, oh, I always move for five minutes a day, it becomes easier for you to start to move more. Exactly. Yeah. Do you get resistance with that? No. Really? Not when we start with it. I keep it so simple that it's hard to resist. Is that, do you think that part of that is because of the way that you hold the frame? Because I imagine that somebody coming into a call with you, it's, it doesn't seem like a lot of room for negotiation. No, there's not. Right. <laughs> so I think I'm, I've done a pretty good job at meeting people at their level and it's, it's easier to read what they're willing to do and what they're not willing to do because I lay it out so simply. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I want to go back to what I just said because I want to make sure I'm clear about it. I don't think that I would want to negotiate it. You, you give the vibe of I'm educated, I'm competent and I'm confident. So if you trust me enough to work with me, I'm just going to give you what it is that you're asking for in a way that you may not ask for it and it's going to work. And I just like, uh, okay, I believe you. And I don't want to, I don't want to challenge you on that anyway. Exactly. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and, and do you write workouts for them? Do you write their nutrition? Like, I mean, how comprehensive is what you're doing? Um, I write the workouts. I help them schedule their days. They do, um, daily check-ins. We talk about sleep. We talk about mood. We talk about, um, 
stress levels. We talk about cycles, digestion, um, mindset. How do you feel with your relationship or how do you feel about your relationship with food this past week? Um, I try to get people out of the habit of like cutting complete food groups. So I don't necessarily do like, I don't do meal plans or anything like that because I'm not an RD. Um, I do a lot of work with Renaissance periodization. So like, I will always point them in the direction of Renaissance periodization. If they need like a full blown template, Mm -hmm. I am always there to handhold. So I help people integrate that into their life. Like how do you meal prep? What's, what's the best way to get that done? (laughs) It's all good. It's good. uh, All kinds of creatures. Hold on one second, Sean. Let me, no problem. So while, while, while I'm holding on for her, George, I have a question for you. Go, shoot. Do, you have, do you ever find that the things that she's solving for her clients lead to issues where she's asking you questions about their relationships with their husbands? Um, I don't think she, she crosses that over with like clients into that, but I, I definitely, yeah, I, I think it helps because it, you know, I think she's, as she's advising people and talking about, Hey, you know, what's your relationship with food? And then how's your day? And then, you know, when stressful situations come up, it can be like, Oh, well, how would you have handled that situation? So I don't know. I don't know that she needs to cross the, how's your marriage boundary to like, it, cause if she tells a woman, for example, um, you need to make time for yourself and here are opportunities for you to do it. If the husband's not supportive of her making that time for herself, I, and I'll ask her when she comes back, I feel like there, there needs to be a conversation around how do we help them become supportive for you? Yeah. I mean, I think we've had some of those, you know, it's always interesting, right? That if someone is on the health and wellness journey and it's a journey, right. And it's, it's not a destination. It's a journey and you're going to be doing it forever. Mm Kind of like what you're talking about, the false peaks, right. That, (laughs) And yes. that health and wellness journey, there's a lot of false peaks. We're like, oh, I want to lose five pounds. Yeah, I did that. Okay, well, now I want to do this. Right. And I think if you try to do it alone, just like most things, it, it's going to be challenging. And if you have a partner, especially a spouse, that's not supportive and on that journey with you, it's challenging. And I, and for me, you know, trying to give advice when, when she asks is, is have that honest conversation. And I think a lot of times people – you know, maybe women, maybe men, but it's having those, uh, honest conversations and being open and vulnerable that, you know, I'm on this journey Mm -hmm. and it's difficult and I want you to be on it with me or at least be supportive in it. And it's important to me. And it's important to me for these reasons. And it should be important to you too, right? That we're, we're on this life journey together. And if, if, if we're not both at least supportive of each other and understanding of why the motivation behind it. And I think having those honest conversations with you know your spouse, and if, if you're not getting the response that you want from that, it, you know, I, I don't know if you, know, you need to go seek outside counseling, but I think you just have to, you definitely have to be open and talk about it. And I think a lot of times we get in the work mode mm-hmm. of life and I think maybe to full circle it back to the beginning, right? You get in that work mode and how do you turn the work mode off and have the vulnerable, like, Hey, I'm a human being and you know, you are as well. And we're on this life journey together and I have needs, you have needs. We both have wants, desires, wishes. And how do we honestly express those to each other and be vulnerable to, to know that, Hey, I, I need help in this area yeah. and I need you to help me. And if, yeah, I think if we did that more, then you, you get more positive responses back. So, I mean, unless people are complete assholes, which sometimes they are, but most of the time, like you married this person because you want to be with them and you, you love and respect them and you know, you want to help. And when they say, Hey, I'm, I, I'm on this journey for X, Y, Z, I need help mm-hmm. in this, that, or the other, that you get that kind you would get a positive response out of it. So Alicia, the way that we got into talking about that was I asked if you ever find yourself needing to cross where someone doesn't do something because of their relationship with their significant other who doesn't support what they're trying to do. Before I get into anything further with you, I know that you do time block your schedule and we're bumping up against the end of the time that I asked you for. And I want to make sure that if you have a hard stop, we can, we can make sure to wrap it in time. Yeah, I, I do. Unfortunately. That's okay. That's okay. 
Yeah. Okay. So I don't know what that looks. She, she just gave you a look. I'm not sure what it was, but <laughs> it's all it's all good. I'm, I'm not sure who the intimidating one is over there. I'm, yeah, exactly. I, I'm not sure she has it right. But so I want to hear a little bit before we wrap up about the nonprofit that you do work with as well. So can you tell me about Amplify Health and Wellness? Yeah, Amplify Health and Wellness. Um, we're basically on a mission to provide quality access to nutrition, fitness, wellness to um, underserved and underrepresented communities and anybody who wants it, basically. So if you're low income, if you're a military family and you move around a lot, um, if you're a frontline worker, um, we do everything from uh, we do. We're actually hopping into a 12 week program right now where similar to lift like a mother coaching, we're basically teaching people how to have a quality or how to add quality to their lifestyle for, um, on whatever budget they're working with. (laughs) And then, um, we also do marketing and business, uh, business coaching for fitness professionals or wellness professionals, mental wellness professionals. Let's say if you're trying to start a business and you have no idea where to even begin, um, I have a really solid team in my community manager and in one of my board members. And we basically handhold people for eight weeks and give them action items and quali- uh, quantitative steps to creating a new business. And can people pay for that if they don't qualify for the under, under? Nope. Okay. Cool. No, I always said that I never set out to make money. Mm -hmm. Um, lift like a mother, the for-profit side just kind of happened and I do it because I love it. And the nonprofit, like it just, I don't know, it fills, it fills some little void in my life. And like, we truly love what we do. Like we love meeting new people. We love supporting the community, um, community workouts. Uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's, I mean, look, some people who pay, pay attention and people who can't afford to pay, there, there are other ways to help them pay attention. Absolutely. And we, we, we have strong, uh, we have strong partnerships in the companies that support us. So I believe that where can people find out more about you too, if they want to, um, George is a ghost. You're not going to find anything about him. <laughs> where are they going to find you? Uh, you can find me at lift like a mother, um, everywhere on social media, www.liftlikeamother.com or www.amplifyhealthandwellness.org. Awesome. George, Alicia, I appreciate you joining me on the show today. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having us, Sean. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Active Life Podcast. If you did, please be sure to head to wherever you listened to it and give us a quality review, as well as five stars if you can spare them. If you want more from us, feel free to follow all of our social media accounts at Active Life Professional, Active Life Rx, and Dr. Sean Pastuch on Instagram. Remember, at Active Life, we believe that the healthcare clinic of the future is the gym and the healthcare provider of the future is the coach. We also believe that that future is now. Time to